Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. <clears throat> and today I remembered the candy, so come get that if uh, you asked stuff last time, and of course if you asked stuff today. So, hey guys, I can hear you, so when I start talking, please stop talking so we can get going. Thank you. Um, I want to start off, actually, speaking of questions and candy, somebody just asked me two great questions from last class, and I wanted to share them with you because it might be confusion that a um, number of you might be dealing with. One question was about what does it mean to amplify a signal? You have a ligand and a receptor, and then you have this protein that's activated, and it can activate a bunch more proteins. Is it that the signal is amplified because more things are conveying it, or is it that the signal is amplified because it somehow increases in intensity? Uh, which is a really good question. Most of the time, although both are possible, most of the time it's because more things are conveying it. And the analogy I would draw for you is that if I, if I say something I want to spread the word about to one person, and that person tells one person, it's going to take a long time to get through to everybody. But if I tell 10 people that thing, and I say each of you go tell 10 more people, then all of a sudden they're going to already bring it up to 100, then those 10 people tell 10 more people each, it takes it to a thousand and so on. So it's amplification because it's like spreading out of the information through a number of different uh, ways of conveying it. That's the amplification we mean when we talk about intracellular signaling proteins that are acting downstream of a signal in a receptor. The second question that was a nice question that was asked was, um, oh yeah, about G alpha and G I, or sorry, G S and G I. So you have G alphas that can be stimulatory, G S's, and G um, alphas that can be inhibitory, G G alpha I's or G I's, right? And um, the question was, well, your book talks about how you can have a, 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 an example where there's an effect that's like a positive effect that starts with a G I, and how does that make sense if it's a G I that's inhibiting? So the key point there that to remember is that there's a difference between the effect on a pathway and the end result of that pathway. So a G I is an inhibitory G alpha because it inhibits the adenyl cyclase-based pathway from being moving forward, but the end result of that could be anything from, you know, um, the cell does a dance to the cell stops talking to the cell, you know, whatever the effect is is sort of independent of that. So you could have an inhibition of a pathway, but then the end result could be what you view as a positive effect, for example, the opening of a channel or um, the contraction of a cell or something like that. So when you think about these things, uh, remember the context of, of activation and of inhibition. All right, so those are just two great questions I wanted to share um, to kind of help these ideas settle in. So for today, I'm going to uh, talk about chapter 17 material. We are now leaving cell signaling behind in the <laughs> most uh, loosest sense of the word because cell signaling is a part of everything. But as far as the details you've been learning, we're going to shift topics um, and for now focus on the structure of a cell, the cytoskeletal elements. Yes, of course. Uh, yes. So the question was talking about delta notch signaling that we talked about last time when you cut off the piece of the, uh, the, the receptor, the notch receptor, and moves into inside the cell. Does that mean that receptor is done for, basically, because it lost its tail? And the answer is yes. Um, notch receptors are recycled quite rapidly, so you'll basically the cell will make a new notch receptor and put it in there. So, Okay, so chapter 17, uh, cytoskeleton of the cell. What makes, so if you didn't have these uh, components I'm going to share with you, intermediate filaments, microtubules, actin filaments, these are the three things we're going to talk about this class and the next class. If you didn't have these things inside of your cell, your cell would basically collapse into like this blobby, useless thing because it wouldn't have anything uh, sustaining it. It's somewhat analogous to our bones and cartilage and ligaments, the things that give us structure. So they're not the most exciting things to talk about, but they're super important because without them, a cell would be splat and wouldn't be able to do anything. This is what the inside of a cell looks like, um, you know, schematically, very roughly speaking. Uh, <clears throat> so here you've got some structures, some organelles you'll recognize that you've learned about. But what we're going to focus on are these rods that are scattered throughout and these other types of shapes here. These things here are intermediate filaments. We're going to talk about those first today, very briefly. Um, these are microtubules. We'll talk about those next. They're long and thin. And then actin filaments, which are also long and thin, and we'll talk about those in the next uh, lecture. So these are the three main components that uh, extend throughout your cytosol. 
They're, they are, they help the cytoskeleton exist. It's attached to the plasma membrane and the membranes of internal organelles. And as such, the cytoskeleton composed of these three elements gives the cell shape and organizes its interior. So I'm going to give you two summary slides of these three different types of um, cytoskeletal components. They have redundant information for the most part. Use whichever one you like or both. This slide and the next slide. They basically have the same stuff. I'm going to take you through this one in detail. So um, one thing to get out of, the way, out of the way right off the bat, actin filaments, which is the, what we're going to talk about in the next lecture, uh, a lot of folks also call them microfilaments. In this class, we'll refer to them as actin filaments, which is the most common name. But just be aware, if you ever come across this term, it's the exact same thing. The nice thing about this name is it tells you already what these components, what these filaments are made of. They're made of actin. Microtubules are made of tubulin. So again, the name tells you what the component is, tubulin. And then intermediate filaments, the name doesn't tell you much, but we'll talk about those in detail. So shown here are examples with a fluorescent protein labeling these different components. So microtubules in green here, actin filaments in red, and again here, intermediate filaments in green. So <clears throat> let's talk about a little bit of what's in this table. Microtubules are made up of uh, protofilaments, and we'll talk about that in more detail. And the subunits of those protofilaments are alpha and beta tubulins. So these are monomers. Remember, you've learned about monomers, dimers, tetramers when it comes to proteins. This is a fundamental building block, a single monomer that called alpha. And this is one beta. And as you can see, they're lined up one after the other, alpha, beta, alpha, beta. They make heterodimers. Hetero for different, dimer for two. So here you go, two different things stuck together. The structure of this is a hollow tube with a wall consisting of protofilaments. Uh, so the inside of this is hollow, and you'll notice here the size of it. This is 25 nanometers wide. You could actually, this is big enough that you could fit either of these into it. This um, actin filaments are only 8 nanometers wide. They'd slide right inside of here pretty easily. And intermediate filaments are roughly about the same size. Intermediate filaments get their name because they're intermediate in size between actin filaments and microtubules. So that's one way to remember them. They're intermediate in size between actin filaments and microtubules. All right? Now, um, don't worry about the actual numbers of the diameters. That's just here, FYI. Here are the monomers I already mentioned. And these molecules, microtubules, have polarity. Polarity simply means your top and your bottom, or your plus n, your minus n, your beginning, your end, they are different. We have polarity, right? My feet don't look like my head. I have polarity. Okay, your cells have polarity. We'll talk about that in detail. And it turns out that uh, proteins have polarity too. You already kind of know this. In fact, you may have explicitly learned that because a protein has an N-terminal end and a C-terminal end. So clearly they're not the same. They have polarity. <clears throat> and when you put proteins together, you can get, as shown here, monomers together, you can end up with a structure such as a microtubule having polarity because it starts with an alpha and it ends with a beta. So the beginning and the end are not the same. These are some of the functions. I'm not going to read them to you right now. We'll go through them. Actin filaments, as I already mentioned, are smaller than microtubules. They are intertwined. This might remind you of how DNA is uh, kind of twined together. It's somewhat similar when you look at the structure. And it com is composed of a monomer called G-actin. So in this case, you have two different monomers. In this case, you have just one. Uh, the way you can remember, uh, one thing actually that's important to remember is that G actin, the monomer, G for globular. Okay, so you see how they're roundish? So you can think of it that way. The, uh, G actin, globular, globe, round. Actin filaments are also referred to as F actin. The F actin, sta the F stands for filaments. So G actin is the globular monomer. F actin is the filament that forms from the globular monomers. So again, the names actually have the information in them. If you start to familiarize yourself with them, then you'll remember this stuff. And just like microtubules, these guys are also polarized. Why are they polarized? We'll get to that when we talk about actin next lecture. OK, and these are some of their functions. Intermediate filaments, um, as I already mentioned, intermediate in size. And we'll talk about how they're put together in a second here. No known polarity. So of the three types, these are the only ones who don't have any polarity. They're, they're, both ends look exactly the same, and I'll explain how that's the case in a second as well. And they're really involved in structural support and a bunch of other stuff. All right, so again, this is the other summary slide. It has the same information I just told you, um, just 
a little bit more info that you can read through. I encourage you uh, to look at both of these slides carefully because putting them together, you'll have a nice sense of what the summary of this lecture and the next lecture is. It's these three types of cytoskeletal components. So, oh, and I forgot to mention one way I like to try and remember these in terms of what they are and what they do is how they look to me. So whether or not, I, it may or may not help you, but as you'll see, intermediate filaments are rope-like. So I tend to think of them as rope. They're really strong. They're involved in structure. They're dense. They're tied together. If you look at rope, it's wound with a bunch of smaller pieces together. Intermediate filaments are a lot like that. Microtubules remind me of uncooked spaghetti. They're long, thin, and while they're stable, if you snap them, they'll break pretty easily. And microtubules are a lot like that. Actin filaments are a lot like cooked spaghetti. They're really wiggly, soft, mushy, and they have a fair amount of flexibility to them. You'd have to really squish it up to try and break it apart. So as you learn about each of these filaments, if it helps you think about them as rope, uncooked spaghetti, and cooked spaghetti, that just works for me. doesn't mean it has to work for you, but I try to give mnemonics and ways to remember stuff throughout class, so just take what works for you and don't worry about the rest. Okay. So um, another quick summary slide about the contributions to cytoskeleton's mechanical stability. Um, this kind of uh, puts my rope and uncooked and cooked spaghetti into a more formal context. You know, microtubules are stiff rods like uncooked spaghetti. Uh, actin filaments are semi-flexible like spaghetti would be after you cook it. And intermediate filaments are like rope where they're flexible, but they're really strong. So um, here are some statements about what they do very broadly. Microtubules resist compression. Actin filaments serve as the basis of contraction. Next lecture. And interfil intermediate filaments can sustain stretching. So these are their, com their contributions to cytoskeletons and mechanical stability. This is not all they do, but this is how they contribute to the cell being a rigid and flexible and useful structure. Neurons are a fun example to share about the integration of these components. They don't work in isolation. Same as with cell signaling, things are working together. Uh, in this case, in this example, this is a axon. Here, this is an electron micrograph, so this would be the cell body. And this is the axon of a single cell uh, coming out here and going splat as its growth cone is looking for where to grow. I don't know if you guys still have those toys where you can take it and you throw it and the end sticks to the surface. It's kind of like that. And keep that in mind because when we talk about migration, um, I guess next lecture, uh, that is actually part of how the first part of migration works, is really moving forward and sticking to something. So if you looked inside of here in this uh, growth cone, this is what you'd see. You'd see microtubules that give it this structure. The uncooked spaghetti helps it really reach out and have that structure that's needed, like my arm is doing right now. But then the end of it, the actin filaments are more like my fingers. You know, they're flexible. They're able to grab onto something and do something with having reached out that far. Uh, and so if you were to look in here and do some staining, the green here is a stain for uh, microtubules, and the red here is a stain for actin filaments. So you can kind of see how they work together and next to each other. Intermediate filaments are also in here. They're just not labeled. OK. So um, let's talk about intermediate filaments in detail. And this is the one we're going to cover in the least amount of detail. They're not the most uh, complicated of structures. Uh, and I liken them to, in addition to the rope analogy, to um, the foundation of your house, you know, if you're, if you want to build a house, there's nothing really exciting about putting the bricks up and all of that jazz, but without the foundation of the house, the house would fall apart. So intermediate filaments really help build that house, the cell. They're strong and rope-like, as I mentioned. So if you do a stain for them, this is what they look like. This is the nucleus of a cell. Here's your cell membrane. And all of this green stuff is intermediate filaments. They're really widely spread out, and they really give the cell its shape and strength. Uh, and we'll watch a quick movie about intermediate filament structure. A complex filaments, intermediate filaments, microtubules, and actin filaments that provide the cells with strength, structure, and movement. Although all eukaryotic cells contain microtubules and actin filaments, intermediate filaments are found only in vertebrates and a number of other soft-bodied animals. <clears throat> intermediate filaments are found in animal cells that require a lot of strength such as the epithelial cells of the skin. Some of these filaments span the length of the cell, connecting cell-cell junctions called desmosomes. These cables of intermediate filaments have a high tensile strength. 
without these filaments, stretching or pressure on the epithelial sheet would cause it to rupture. <coughs> Each filament is rope-like, consisting of eight thinner strands made of a precise hierarchical arrangement of protein subunits. At the lowest level, two monomers associate with each other to create a twisted dimer. Two dimers then line up to form a staggered tetramer. Note that the two dimers are arranged in opposite orientations, with their amino terminal ends away from each other, so that the two ends of the tetramer are indistinguishable. Tetramers then link end to end. Thus building up one strand of an intermediate filament. A total of eight strands stack together and twist around each other to create the intermediate filament. This stacking provides the extensive lateral contacts between the strands that give the filament its remarkable mechanical strength. An electron micrograph shows the appearance of intermediate filaments that have been assembled in a test tube. Okay, so let's talk about that last part in detail, the structure of these guys, how it's put together. So as the video mentioned, you have um, a really densely packed combination of a number of proteins, and they're all starting with the same monomer. So if you look up here, you have this monomer, um, you know, and as proteins do, they have an N-terminal end and a C-terminal end. And the first thing that happens is that it's put together into a coiled, coiled dimer. So now you've got two subunits that are making this up. That, in turn, is turned into a staggered tetramers, tetra for four. Now, this is where the polarity disappears. This is why intermediate filaments don't have polarity. Up until now, you had an N-terminal end and a C-terminal end. But because these dimers come together with their tails arranged, sort of facing opposite, what, the opposite way, you end up with the end terminal end being at each end of this protein, and all of a sudden your overall polarity is gone. That's why they're not polar. So now you've got this uh, tetramer that's nonpolar, and that then is um, put together with seven other ones, so eight total tetramers are put together. At this point, you have eight times four, 32 subunits in this thing. And that then is densely coiled together to give you your intermediate filament. So an intermediate filament has 32 subunits that are really tightly wound together. And if you think about taking anything, 32 pieces of string, 32 pieces of, uh, I don't know, rope or thin rope, whatever it is, if you did that, you can imagine how anything would get really strong. 32 pieces of paper, it's going to get strong. So that's why these, these filaments are so robust. Um, okay. Um, I, sh I shifted the order of a couple of slides here, so if it doesn't quite match your PDFs, but it's updated in Lecture Capture, um, and I didn't remove any slides. They're just in slightly different order here to make it make more sense. So um, to summarize some of this, intermediate filaments differ from microtubules and actin filaments in that they do not appear to be polarized, and the amino acid composition of each protein differs from tissue to tissue. The second part I haven't told you about yet, and that's the next slide. The amino acid composition of each protein differs from tissue to tissue. So by contrast, before I tell you that, Actin filaments and microtubules, uh, the other two types, they're pretty consistent across cell types. I mean, if I give you an actin filament from a muscle cell or an actin filament from a neuron, they're going to look roughly similar, probably exactly the same in most cases. But intermediate filaments are not, not done that way. So what happens is that you have four major types of intermediate filaments, uh, and that's based on the structure, the, what basically what, what is the amino acid sequence of the monomer that makes that 32 monomer based intermediate filament? That sequence is slightly different in, in different cell types. Uh, and so everything I've shown you about how they're put together here is the same, but the individual component has, has changed. So there's four types, as I mentioned, um, one in the nucleus, three in the cytoplasm. Sorry. Uh, in the nucleus, you have what are called nuclear lamins. So they, these are intermediate filaments that are found um, on the periphery of the nucleus and help give it its structure. All animal cells have these. <coughs> Excuse me. There are three types of cytoplasmic intermediate filaments, keratin filaments, vimentin and vimentin-related filaments, and neurofilaments. This is probably easiest to remember because it's got neuro in there. So neurofilaments are in neurons or nerve cells, same thing. Uh, keratin filaments, if you know... Um, if you're familiar with stuff about skin or watch those commercials where they talk about keratin, this, that, and the other for products that I don't know do what. Um, but basically, keratin is one of your components of your skin, so you can use that to 
Remember the fact that these are in epithelial cells, right? You're, you have lots of epithelial cells on your skin surface. And then that leaves vimentin and vimentin-related filaments that are uh, present in connective tissue cells, muscle cells, and glial cells. So those are your four major types of intermediate filaments. Okay, so I already mentioned this several times, but basically they strengthen cells against stress. Um, this is an example from your book that I just wanted to share that's really kind of neat. Uh, this is a wild type, this is a cross-section through the skin of a mouse that has wild type keratin protein. And this is a cross-section through the skin of a mouse that has mutant keratin that's not working. Remember, keratin is that intermediate filament in your epithelial cells. And then when you, if you try to like cause some injury, a general injury on the skin of this mouse, you can see what happens. These cells, everything gets rolled up and squished because that integrity is gone because you're missing the keratin that helped give it that structure. So this is really, really important for um, maintaining your integrity of your, of your tissues. And by the way, if you're wondering about scale, 40 micrometers is this. On average, a cell is 10 micrometers wide, plus or minus a big standard deviation. So this is a lot of, this is, uh, a lot of cells here uh, going across in the skin of this mouse. Yes? Sorry? Is that scar tissue on the right side? The question is, is that scar tissue on the right side? Um, I don't know, but I, w I would not be surprised if some of it is, like the darker skin staining. Yeah, it's quite likely there is scar tissue here from the injury. It's a good eye. Any other questions? Okay. All right, so I mentioned there are uh, intermediate filaments in the nuclear envelope, so let's briefly look at those. The nuclear envelope has to be supported in the same way that the overall cell has to be supported. And so you have just inside of here in blue, so this is the nuclear envelope. The cytosol is out here. Here's your nucleus. The brown represents chromatin, condensed DNA. Uh, and right along this layer, you have those lamins that I mentioned to you, the nuclear lamina, which, is cons which consists of intermediate filaments called lamins. So that's pretty much it there, and this is a cross-section through that. You're looking at a cross-section of those intermediate filaments here. That's how you give the nucleus its stability. And that is all we're going to do in terms of intermediate filaments. All right? Not the most exciting type of uh, thing to talk about again. They basically are foundational to keeping the cell and the nucleus intact, but of course very important as far as staying alive goes. What we're going to do for the rest of the class is talk about microtubules. Microtubules do a ton of different things. That's why we're going to spend so much time on them. Uh, this slide and this next slide are your bullet points. These are the summary statements of all the things we're going to cover and thus the things that you should know and understand. So, you know, looking ahead to when people start to wonder what you should study, this is what you should study, the things that I summarize and highlight for you. Okay? So this one and this one uh, have all the bullet points. So let's start at the beginning. Microtubules are hollow tubes with structurally distinct ends. I already kind of covered this in the summary slides, but we're going to go into it in more detail now. So remember the microtubules I mentioned are com composed of two different subunits, alpha and beta tubulin, hence the name microtubules. All of this is, you know, fits together, right? Tubulin makes uh, microtubules. They're hollow, like tubes are, so you can remember that they're tubes that way. They're hollow. They don't have anything inside. And this is what they look like. Um, this is from a side view, a single protofilament. The dark green in this diagram is a beta subunit, and the light green is an alpha. So you can see how they're arranged one after the other. Microtubules have a plus end and a minus end. That's that polarity I mentioned to you. The two ends are different. The minus and plus is simply what they're called. That's, you have to call them something. So the minus end is this one, where the alpha is, the first alpha. And the plus end is where that last beta is. And this will become clearer when we start looking at how they form and, and dissociate. So you take these protofilaments and you line them up one after the other and you start to form a ring. And if you looked at the cross section, this is what it would look like. You have a lumen, an empty space in the middle, and you have this nice structure of microtubules uh, all around. I mean, of the microtubule, composed of these protofilaments all around. This is what it looks like if you take an electron micrograph. You can actually see this. This is a microtubule, and here's that cross section matching right here, and you can see the individual protofilaments there. So we're actually able to image these things and see what they look like. The centrosome is the major microtubule organizing center in animal cells. This is the first use of the microtubules that we'll talk about. The, its use as part of um, the centrosome and how it sends out microtubules across the cell. So let's look at this diagram here. This is a cross-section through the cell. Here's your nucleus. Here's a few other things you might recognize, Golgi, mitochondria, etc. Near the nucleus, you will find in animal cells a centrosome. 
And before I get into that, let me back up a step and tell you what I've written here. So microtubules are nucleated by, well, let me back up a step further, actually. What does it mean to nucleate? To nucleate means to start something, to create something from scratch. Okay? Um, and so when it says a microtubule is nucleated, what that means is a microtubule is begun by or started by whatever that thing is. What starts microtubules up are called, micro, or appropriately enough, microtubule organizing centers, or MOCs. They organize the microtubules. They start the microtubules. Now, I'm not going to talk about this term mock beyond here, but again, it is something you'll see a lot because it is the broadest term you can think of that encompasses stuff that makes microtubules. In this class, because we're focused on animal cells, we're going to talk about a specific type of mock, the centrosome. So a centrosome is a type of mock, and it is the type of mock found in animal cells. All right? Centrosomes are located near the nucleus, and that's shown in this really pretty image here where you have your cell membranes in red, you have your microtubules in green. Notice if you look at this, it's, like, it's almost like a spider web that comes back to a point, and this is that central point here. If you looked at these, you see most of them are kind of ending up back here. They're ending up back here because that's where they started and that is the centrosome. So what is the centrosome? Let's zoom in on it and look at it in detail. The centrosome compo is composed of all of these things here. Those things are a pair of centrioles and a centrosome matrix. All right? So um, if, if the centrosome matrix is this green goop that's basically surrounding these centrioles that are inside of it, and the centrioles are arranged perpendicularly at 90 degrees angle and 90 degree angles to each other. If you want to remember this, I don't know if it helps. I, you know, I try to remember centrioles by thinking, well, they look to me like pasta, and eole sounds to me like the end of a pasta, but I can't think of a pasta right now that ends with eole. I don't know. So find a way to remember this. But the centrioles are the centrioles are the pastas, and they're in the middle, and then you've got this goop around you. That's the matrix. All right. Um, like I said, some of these things will help you, some of them won't help you. <laughs> um, but anyway, you've got the centrioles in there, and then you've got this matrix, and on the matrix you have nucleating sites. So remember I just told you, nucleation means what? Who? To start something, yes. So the nucleating sites are where you start the microtubules growth. All right? So basically, you have these, and they're called gamma tubulin ring complexes. Remember I told you that here we've got alpha and beta tubulin. There's a third type of tubulin called gamma, alpha, beta, gamma. That's the next letter. And so gamma tubulin makes a ring here, and that ring is the base on which those protofilaments are going to grow out and make the microtubules. So each of these rings represents the start of a single microtubule that's going to grow out from there. That's what's shown here. So these microtubules grow out. The minus end is here and the plus end is out here. So if you go back here, minus end is at your, is bound, is basically at your uh, ring, the, and then your plus end is reaching out. Now you can remember that because things, thinking about something growing from a minus to a plus is hopefully intuitive, right? You're growing out towards the plus end. Um, yeah, any questions about this? Yes. What are the made up? What is that? They are made up of a, big protein complex, uh, and the, the centrioles centrio basically help anchor and provide to this matrix, so this matrix is composed of a number of secreted things. Um, beyond that, I'm not entirely sure what they do. <laughs> I mean, they're usually talked about as like, okay, look, here are the centrioles as part of the centrosome, and here's what the centrosome does. So I'm not quite sure beyond that any more detail. Yeah. I should look that up, though. That reminds me, you had a question about positively charged proteins. So I looked, and I looked online and a bunch of stuff. I could not find any evidence that positively charged proteins are more likely to bind uh, to, you were asking about, I think, the RTKs, right? Binding the adapter proteins? Yeah, so I don't think, I don't think the charge affects that, because I, didn't, I couldn't find any information on that. So. All right. Um, OK, so then moving on back to our microtubules. This is what they look like Tubule. when you have this process. Grow from the centrosome added to a cell extract. Quite suddenly, however, some microtubules stop growing and then shrink back rapidly, a behavior called dynamic instability. So 
Uh, those were that. This was basically microtubules. This is the centrosome here in the middle, and these are the microtubules extending out. And as you can see, they don't just extend out. What I'll tell you about next is that they also then retract and come back, and that's called dynamic instability, and that's what we're going to talk about next. Um, before we move on, though, this is kind of bugging me. Joe, do you know if cent centrioles do anything specific beyond what I said, the vague thing I said? To me, they've just always been this part of the centrosome, but I don't know if they... Yeah, okay. Yeah, it's hard to know. Yeah. yeah. All right. It seems like there are even some signals for the microtubules to grow, like it's flesh and come from it, so it's like signaling. Well, we'll talk about how that happens. Um, but what I, what I don't know is, you know, centrioles, most components, most organelles in a cell have multiple roles. So I, I don't know what, you know, it's possible we, I don't know what we don't know about centrioles, and in fact, even what we do know. But what I can tell you is that their important role here is to anchor and be a part of this matrix that the microtubules grow off of. How they grow is what we're going to talk about next. Okay. So, dynamic instability. What is that? Yes? So the microtubules, they originate at the gamma? That's exactly right. They don't go inside Correct. Yeah. The question was, the microtubules originate at the gamma ring. Do they go inside of the matrix? And no, they originate at the gamma ring. That's the base. And they go out from there. Okay. So this is a really boring, simple diagram about di dynamic instability to get things started. Here are your centrioles. Here's your centrosome with the matrix. And then you have microtubules growing out and coming back in. So let's talk about how that happens. Uh, the first thing I want to tell you is what one of the things that the dynamic instability accomplishes, and that's shown here. So if you have the cell, and you have your centrosome here, and the arrows indicate microtubules forming and microtubules coming back, if the cell decides that I want to extend out in this direction, one of the ways it can do that is to encourage the microtubules to stay stable in this direction, but not in the other ones. And so that's what's shown here. The microtubules are growing out in all these different directions, but there's a type of protein called a microtubule capping protein in red here. And those microtubule capping proteins help to stabilize microtubules. So if the cell um, positions those in one part of itself, it can stabilize microtubules in that region. And by doing so and letting the other parts come back being unstable, you can start to extend yourself out in a certain direction. So that's one of the uses of microtubules being stabilized. Now the stability ba is based on two things this very vague term called microtubule capping protein that we will not go into too much detail on. There's a bunch of different types. And what the microtubule capping protein is acting upon. What is it acting upon? It's acting upon something called a GTP cap. And we'll talk about that in more detail, but it's shown as a summary here. The GTP cap protects the filament from shrinking. Microtubule capping proteins then prevent the disassembly by binding to and stabilizing the positive end that has this cap on it. So I'm going to tell you about the cap in detail, but imagine you've got this long microtubule. It's got the cap on, like a literal cap, if you will, and then something grabs onto that cap and says, you're not going anywhere. And that's what this microtubule capping protein is doing. All right? So let's look at that. GTP hydrolysis is what drives dynamic instability, which fits with what I just told you. There's a GTP cap, all right? Now, you'll notice the same things are coming back. We've talked so much about ATP... GTP, GDP in so many different contexts. Here's GTP again. GTP hydrolysis turns GTP into GDP. You already learned about that in cell signaling, right? GTP aces drive that process. Here it is. The cell is reusing the biology for an entirely different purpose. So um, let's look at a growing microtubule first. This is your minus end, and this microtubule is growing out in this direction. The gr light green represents um, uh, well, so these represent alpha and beta dimers that are going to contribute to your, your growing um, microtubule. And the red represents a monomer where GTP is bound to that monomer. So GTP tubulin. What happens is that when you are building your microtubule, what I haven't told you yet is that the tubulin that's added has GTP tagged onto it. And one of those two dimer, one of those two monomers. And that's why you end up with basically half of your components here, your monomers, having a GTP cap on it. That GTP cap, so when we say GTP cap, we really are talking about small caps on every dimer, right? This is, oh, whoop, 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 sorry about that. This is a cap, this is a cap, this is a cap. Because those caps are there, 
the shape change that it causes to the dimers helps bring it stability. It makes it harder for the cell to tear that microtubule apart. As a result, you keep adding and you keep growing. The GTP hydrolysis that would be required here is, is, is not happening quickly enough. Now, conditions can change. A cell can um, change this dynamic, the, the dynamics of this reaction such that it becomes easier now to hydrolyze this GT, GTP. Sorry, When you hydrolyze the GTP, you take away the, that last phosphate group, you turn these back into GDP, so now they're no longer red in this diagram. Now this end of the microtubule is not as stable. These parts remain fairly stable because they're kind of inside and they're, you know, they're surrounded by a bunch of these monomers. But the ones at the end here that are no longer GTP capped, they start to come apart. There's enzymes in your cell that will just tear them apart and there's a low dissociation constant anyway, so these things just start coming apart very quickly. So the default state for this, it's like, um, you know, one of the things you'll notice in a second here that one of the reasons that microtubules are so useful is they can become the highway of the cell and they can help take different components throughout the whole cell. So imagine if Chicago as a city could quickly build a road and destroy the road and build the road and destroy the road to go where you need to go. You wouldn't have to worry about traffic jams anymore because, of course, our roads are falling apart anyway, but if you could just build a new one really quickly, then you'd have a nice new way to travel. And then if people all of a sudden wanted to go that way, you take this road apart and you build the road that way, now people can go that way. That's one of the major things that the cell does with microtubules, and the dynamic instability is a big part of how it does it. Because these are almost transient structures, it can build them out when it needs to by stabilizing this GTP cap, and then when it doesn't need them anymore, it can uh, promote the dissociation of the cap, the microtubule falls apart, it can use the monomers and build a road to somewhere else. And it keeps doing that over and over and over again. So um, I'll show you a movie that sums up some of what I just told you, you know, just so you have it repetition, and then we'll talk about it some, oh, yes. To, yeah, so to my knowledge, no. The question was, does the GTP ever attach to the alpha? And I think I remember looking this up a long time ago, and I did not see any evidence uh, anybody's found of that happening. That doesn't mean it doesn't happen or that I didn't miss it, but as far as I know, it uh, was attached to the beta. Yeah. Microtubules. Sorry, it's loud. Try that again without blowing your ears out. Microdynamics are the skeletal polymers essential for all cells. They are made of the protein tubulin, an alpha-beta heterodimer that self-assembles head-to-head, making protofilaments, which themselves associate laterally, making a cylindrical wall. Tubulin binds the small molecule GTP, or guanosine triphosphate. During microtubule polymerization, this molecule is hydrolyzed to GDP, or guanosine diphosphate. The GDP-bound form of tubulin is unstable in the microtubule and gives rise to the phenomenon of microtubule dynamic instability, by which microtubules switch between growing and shrinking phases. When microtubules lose a critical layer of GTP-containing tubulin subunits, shown in brown, they deeply rise by peeling and curving of the protofilaments. Although protofilament peels are short-lived, we stabilize them for structural analysis to define the tubulin arrangement and conformation within them. These disassembly intermediates break down into smaller pieces. We found that in the GDP depolymerized form, the tubulin dimer makes bent contacts, but is also bent itself with a 12 degree angle. Upon GDP exchange for GTP, the tubulin subunit is straightened, allowing it now to repolymerize, making both longitudinal and lateral interactions. The resulting assembly intermediate is an open sheet that is very short-lived, but we were able to stabilize into helical ribbons that were amenable to structural studies by electron microscopy and image analysis. This polymer shows the protofilaments arranging pairs with contacts that alternate between those found in the cylindrical microtubule and new contacts never described before. The arrangement is said to be able to roll into a tube 
when it reaches the right width and length. The closing up of the microtubule is a highly cooperative zipping up process. Thus, microtubule growth occurs by sequential sheet extension followed by microtubule closure. Driven by the hydrolysis of GTP, microtubules switch between growing and shrinking phases via the structural intermediates just described, giving rise to a very dynamic cellular cytoskeleton that performs essential functions in the cell, from transport of cellular organelles to division of the genetic material between daughter cells during cell division. Microtubules are fascinating nanodevices that have evolved to undergo amazingly complex assembly processes. So notice uh, one thing she mentioned, shape changes. She had those angles there, like 5 degrees and 12 degrees or something, but that addition of the GTP um, capping it, and then its removal when you go from GTP to GDP, is causing shape changes. It always comes, seems to come back to the same thing, right? Proteins change shape, it, it increases or decreases their stability and what they interact with. So some of the same concepts are back. Um, and then I have, I think, one or two more movies just for fun for you. Contrast, when all microtubules are labeled with GFP tubulin, the true extent of the microtubule cytoskeleton emerges. Both growing and shrinking microtubules can be observed. No, I guess that was it. Okay. <laughs> um, <clears throat> all right. So the next thing we'll briefly talk about is how microtubule dynamics can be modified by drugs. And you might recognize a couple of these names, Taxol and Colchicine. Uh, these are, and Vinblastine as well, often used to treat um, certain cancers. And one of the things that you'll learn that towards the end of this class we've already kind of touched upon is how cancer cells over-proliferate. So if you have a cancer cell over proliferating or proliferating at a higher rate, dividing more than a normal cell, what if you could try to target that cell division and therefore reduce the ability of the cancer to spread? Turns out Taxol and Colchicine, both of which are used actively, block cells in mitosis. In other words, they stop cells from dividing. And they do this because they're binding and stabilizing microtubules, or in this case, binding tubulin dimers and preventing them from polymerizing. So whether you are encouraging the microtubules to stay built, in other words, your highway is built out and you're not taking it apart, or conversely, you're stopping the highway from being built at all because you're uh, not letting those dimers make that long microtubule, you have stopped the dynamic instability. And by stopping that dynamic instability, you're interfering with a ton of processes, including mitosis, because as you may recall from your earlier classes in biology, um, the separation of DNA is dependent on microtubules as are many other functions. Now you might be asking yourself, but other cells are also dividing. Your normal cells are dividing. So how can you do this just for cancer cells? And the answer is, using a traditional technique like this, you can't. And that's the problem. One of the biggest problems we face in cancer therapy right now is that, um, and why if you know anyone who's undergone chemotherapy, it's pretty brutal on them, because in many ways we end up poisoning our bodies to kill off the cancer. You have to do what you have to do. And so anything that affects the ability of a cancer cell to, to divide will also affect the ability of your normal cells to divide. It's problematic. So we want to get to the day where we can do these chemotherapeutic interventions um, in a targeted manner, where we hopefully can target cancer cells and not so much your normal cells so as to keep you, know, you a little bit healthier during that process. But we'll get to that again towards the end of the class. Um, okay, so. The next thing we'll talk about <clears throat> is sort of this, uh, I'll talk about three different bullet points at once. Microtubules organize the cell interior. I've already kind of alluded to that a little bit. Motor proteins drive intracellular transport. We'll talk about what motor proteins are, how they do that, and why we're talking about microtubules. And so microtubules and motor proteins position organelles in the cytoplasm, um, which is part of this transport. So to introduce that, I'm gonna step back and first tell you uh, that there are two types of microtubules in your eukaryotic cells. So far, we've only talked about one general type, those in your cytoplasm, your cytosol, right? And there's a second type, axonemo, and we'll talk about those a little bit later. As you've already seen, cytoplasmic microtubules are very dynamic, dynamic instability. Axonemo microtubules, on the other hand, which we'll get to in a bit, are stable. They don't undergo that dynamic instability. 
Cytoplasmic microtubules are responsible for organelle transport and the segregation of chromosomes. You saw that already a little bit. Well, you haven't seen it directly, but you've seen the instability, and we'll talk about how that leads to uh, these things. Axonemal microtubules, on the other hand, allow eukaryotic cells to move water over their surface or do other things, and we'll get to that in a bit. But again, this is just kind of an overview slide. So a lot of this we've already covered and talked about. This, by the way, is DNA in blue, and here you've got your microtubules in green pulling it apart, part of the cell cycle, part of mitosis. Okay, so how do you move things along a, uh, along a microtubule? Um, there's two types of movement, anterograde and retrograde. Anterograde movement is away from the cell body. Retrograde movement is towards the cell body. And you can remember this because retro is old or old school, you know, like my retro fashion sense or something. Um, and that retrograde is going then back, back to the cell body, okay? Whereas anterograde is going out towards the end of the cell. So here's anterograde transport, and this is retrograde transport. A nerve cell is a great example of how useful this is, but it's useful in every cell that you have. Um, if you've got your axon terminal really far away from your cell body, how do you get stuff done over here? Like imagine if you made every protein here and made every decision here, and then the decisions or the proteins have to get over here. That's really tricky to pull off. Why not move some of the machinery over there instead? You know, it's like um, if you're doing assembly of something in the factory and you assemble the whole thing in the factory and you ship it out, that can be quite cumbersome. What if you ship out the parts instead and maybe you do some of the assembly at the very end where it's going? For example, they do this with like parts of the space shuttle and stuff like that. So um, in this case, uh, you transport those parts, whatever they might be, you need two different parts of the cell. Uh, and it happens along microtubules. How does this happen? Well, let's talk about it. So to first remind you then, I love this image, this is gorgeous, right? So here you've got your nuclei in green, your actin is in purple, which we haven't talked about yet, and your microtubules are in yellow. You can kind of guess where some of these, um, these centrosomes are, so here's a likely centrosome right near the nucleus. And this really gives you a sense of how it's the highway of the cell. Shown here is a detailed view of how the transport is happening along these microtubules. This is a recap of what it's composed of, so we won't get into it. Uh, and then here, again, is a recap of what we've already been talking about, alpha and beta tubulin and blah, 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 assembly, disassembly. So let's zoom in on here and take a look at how transport is taking place. That's what this is. There are two major components that help microtubules do this transport. One is dynein, and the other is, yes? Yeah, so the question is, do you have this transport happening in all different types of cells, even if they're different shapes or different types of cells? And absolutely, yes. This is something that's quite common to across your cells. The nerve cell is just a really nice example, but there's many examples. And some of those we're going to talk about right here, actually. So um, in this diagram, here's your centrosome. There are your centrioles. This is your matrix. These would be those gamma tubulin-based nucleation sites, minus end of the microtubule coming out like this, plus end over here. These are some of the components that are traveling along the, the microtubules. Um, notice how diverse they are. You can actually carry, well, let me back up and first, I was telling you about these two things. So dynein and kinesin are called are motor proteins, and they're called motor proteins because they, mo they, they actually move. They move along the microtubules. That's why they are called motor proteins. Now, dynein uh, moves stuff, and it's shown here in red, towards the minus end. So this is dynein here. It's got two little subunits like this bound to the microtubule and a bigger subunit here and that's bound to, in this case, a lysosome, and it's moving that lysosome towards the minus end, and in other words, towards the, center, towards the center of the cell or basically towards the centrosome. So dynein moves uh, different things, different packages, if you will, towards the minus end. Kinesin does the opposite. It takes different things towards the plus end. So here's an example of kinesin in blue bound to a piece of endoplasmic reticulum, and it's moving it towards the periphery of the cell. So um, remember these however you like, um, dynein to minus, kinesin to plus. Uh, I, t I tend to remember this as like dynein to minus is DM or MD. So many of you want to get an MD or direct message DM because, you know, I'm cool, I DM people. 
right. So whatever it takes, come up with some mnemonic to help you remember this. Uh, dynine goes to the minus end, and if you remember that, then you'll know that kinesin, the other one, must go the other way to the positive end, or the plus end, sorry, I shouldn't call it the positive end. Minus end and plus end. Okay. So notice the number of different things that can be carried here, different examples. Secretory vesicles, a Golgi apparatus, mitochondria, endosomes, pigment granules, um, lysosomes, ER. These things that we learn about in class as, oh, look, there's a mitochondrion sitting there. Oh, look here, we're going to teach you about the ER, and we're going to teach you about, you know, cis and trans Golgi. And you, you, it creates an impression that these things are just hanging around, right, in one spot in a cell. Not the case. The cell is moving these different parts of its machinery to wherever it needs them the most. There's a lot of rapid movement happening back and forth inside of your cell. And it's dependent in large part on these microtubules. So they really are the highways of the cell, taking things where they need to get to. And if you remember that neuron example with the long axon, now you can imagine that if you really want to create a bunch of, um, let's say, modified proteins at your axon terminal, maybe you want to take some of your ER and ship it that way. Right? So it's a pretty neat process, actually, to make things more efficient for the cell. Any questions about that so far? Yes? Absolutely. Correct. Yeah, it's transport. It's pure and simple transport. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> okay, so motor proteins, how do they work? Protein kinesin is two identical motor heads. Each head, a catalytic core, and a neck linker. In the cell, kinesins pull organelles along microtubule tracks. The organelle attaches to the other end of the long coiled coil that holds the two motor heads together. The organelle is not shown here. In solution, both kinesin heads contain tightly bound ADP and move randomly, driven by Brownian motion. When one of the two kinesin heads encounters a microtubule, it binds tightly. Microtubule binding causes ADP to be released from the attached head. ATP then rapidly enters the empty nucleotide binding site. This nucleotide exchange triggers the neck linker to zipper onto the catalytic core. This action throws the second head forward and brings it near the next binding site on the microtubule. The attached trailing head hydrolyzes the ATP and releases phosphate. As the neck linker unzippers from the trailing head, the leading head exchanges its nucleotide and zippers its neck linker onto the catalytic core, and the cycle repeats. In this way, Kinesin dimers move processively, step by step, along the microtubule. So that, in a nutshell, is how motor proteins work. The example here is kinesin, but the same thing applies to dynein. It just moves in the opposite direction. And how it moves in the opposite direction versus in this direction, that's not really shown here. I don't really know the answer to that. Presumably, it's differential binding about the... Uh, polarity of the proteins, but that's sort of above and beyond the scope of this class. Uh, the important point here is what they just described to you. This is an ATP-dependent process. So again, we're back to the same old molecules. In this case, ATP is the energy source. It, it, the binding, uh, or the exchange of ATP, and then the hydrolysis. It not only is it creating the energy that's going to make an active process happen, but it's causing shape changes that help this bind or unbind from the microtubules in a sequential way that moves everything forward. And that's shown here step-by-step uh, step in this diagram. Uh, and this is just an explanation. This is basically what I said. It's thought that the front head binds or hydrolyzes ADP more slowly. Then the rear head comes loose from the backside, floats forward, and then it's going to bind and repeat the process. And if, if you do this enough times, you're going to basically step forward one after the other. It's not too different from how we walk, I guess. Um, so kinesins kinesi and dynines then, I kind of already said this, they use the energy of ATP hydrolysis to move along microtubules. These two diagrams show the exact same thing as this one. I just like, I know it's a little bit complicated, so I give you three different ways to look at it. One, two, three, and a movie. Um, they have different levels of detail. This is the simplest one. Um, you know, so you can kind of see here, binding, ATP's binding, you have hydrolysis, release, and movement. 
Um, so you should just generally understand this process and be familiar with the fact that it's ATP dependent and that it, ATP is providing the energy to do this, as well as, of course, the shape changes. Uh, this happens super fast. This is a um, uh, sort of time lapse of a, um, of a kinesin molecule moving along a microtubule. Um, and I believe these are a few seconds apart. So you can imagine this process taking place pretty quickly, moving across this microtubule here. And I'll show you one more video that kind of, that illustrates this in action. You're going to see little components moving along the microtubule. And you might also recall, recall a video I showed you last week from Twitter where there was um, something being carried, uh, RTK was being carried along um, a cytoskeletal component. And at that time I told you, oh, I'm not going to tell you what that component is. Well, that component was a microtubule. And the RTK was being carried along that microtubule by either a kinesin or a dynein. Uh, so let's take a look at this now in this video. Experiment a st containing many different organelles is added to microtubules. Motor proteins are normally attached to the organelles. When ATP is added as a fuel for the motor proteins, some organelles bind microtubules and are moved along the tracks by their motors. Most kinesin motors move towards the plus end of microtubules. Dynein motors always move in the opposite direction. Both motors are used to transport organelles, and occasionally a single organelle, which must have both types of motor attached, can be seen to switch directions. The bidirectional traffic observed here is reminiscent of that in an intact cell. All right, and then just for fun, I have a few more videos for you, some of which I've shown you before, and now they'll have a lot more context. So let's just play those. Governed by the principles of dynamic instability, microtubules constantly extend into the leading edge of a migrating cell and retract again. Superimposed on the dynamic microtubule cytoskeleton, shown here in red, the membrane network of the endoplasmic reticulum, shown here in green, exhibits its own dynamic behavior as tubes are extended by motor proteins on the microtubule tracks. So this is a great example of what I was trying to convey, that the green is the, e the endoplasmic reticulum, right? And you just see it in a picture as this like thing sitting there. But look at how it's not that static. It's, there's a lot happening here as this is moving around inside of the cell and using the microtubules to help it move itself around. So there's a lot going on in there. Passenger proteins exiting the Golgi apparatus on the way to the cell surface are often packaged into tubular transport vesicles of significant size. Such tubular vesicles can branch and fragment before they fuse with the plasma membrane. The transport vesicles move along microtubules, which are stained here with a red fluorescent dye. The green cell in the corner does not contain fluorescent microtubules. You can see those little tiny dots moving around there. You know, when we taught you about, Dr. Lin taught you about exocytosis, it's like, oh, okay, yeah, you make these vesicles and then they get, the stuff gets spit outside the cell. Okay, but how does it get there? Now you know how it gets there. These different things we tell you about, everything's connected, right? So these exosomes are using these uh, microtubules as a transport mechanism. Fluorescently labeled membrane proteins start their journey to the plasma membrane after synthesis in the endoplasmic reticulum. They are first dispersed throughout the extensive membrane network of the endoplasmic reticulum, from where they move to exit sites that form in random locations in the membrane network. At each of these sites, the membrane proteins are concentrated and packaged into transport vesicles. <coughs> Clusters of the transport vesicles fuse to form transport intermediates. At the next stage, transport intermediates move along microtubule tracks to the Golgi apparatus near the center of the cell. The membrane proteins exit the Golgi apparatus. They move in transport vesicles that are now pulled outward on microtubules, which deliver them to the plasma membrane. Each time a Golgi-derived vesicle fuses with the plasma membrane, its content proteins disperse. So you just watched fluorescently tagged protein being let out of the cell and dispersing.
That's kind of cool. I'm just saying it. All right. So, uh, very quickly, because I want to give you more recent uh, videos, Twitter break time. All right. And this is uh, Sabine Petri is an excellent researcher, and she made this movie a long time ago. Um, you have microtubules in red, and the plus ends are marked by a protein that's in green. And look at the number of seconds passing here and see what happens. It's like, as she put it, fireworks, you know? Um, you can see over just a few seconds how rapidly these microtubules will grow and that the green protein is marking the plus end of them as, they, as they're forming. And presumably she's adding something to the culture to stimulate the growth really rapidly. We don't know what, but something in this experiment. So that's kind of fun. And as a prelude of the next lecture, another video from Dylan Burnett, whose work I've shown before, actin filaments in this one are going to be red and microtubules are going to be green. Uh, and you'll see how closely interacting they are. And what happens when he um, adds actin monomer after he's taken it away to the system. So you've got actin and, mo and microtubules. At first, there's not enough actin there. Then he adds some actin, which is going to be in red, and see what happens. So let's start this from the beginning. All right, so you wash it out, and you know the actin go, filaments go away. Microtubules are there. And then you know, if you start it over, then, it, then it, I think he adds it, or, or he starts with it not being there. Yeah, so it's a dynamic process, basically. So it's kind of neat to watch take place. OK, so that then takes us back to our lecture slides. We have uh, about 10 to 15 minutes to go. Um, these are some neat examples I wanted to share with you. Remember I mentioned pigment granules can be carried along as well. These pigment granules can be aggregated inside of a cell or moved along microtubules to the outside, and that actually affects the pigmentation of species such as zebrafish. Right? So we all have pigment granules, some of us more than others, right? if you have a lot of um, uh, skin tone. Uh, and so we don't necessarily we don't do this, but animals that uh, have camouflage, for example, can rapidly change their pigmentation patterns and colors by taking their granules and either concentrating them or sending them out, as shown here, inside of a single cell. And the, end, and the net effect of that is something like this, where you have, I'm going to speed it up because it's a slow video, but this fish is going to change color in response to what it's near and around. And that's in, because it's having these pigment granules that are uh, being sent in and out of its cells. And this one, I think, is a little bit more dramatic. So coloration changes right there. So pretty cool. That's microtubule-based. All right, oops. OK, so the next thing we're going to talk about in the next few minutes um, are microtubules doing an entirely different thing. Remember I told you cytoplasmic and axonemal. Now we're going to talk about that axonemal type of microtubules. <clears throat> Cilia and flagella, which you've probably heard about, um, contain stable microtubules. Yes? So because uh, the microtubules are hollow, is the transport happening in the interior or the exterior? The question is, is the transport happening on the microtubules inside of them or on the outside? It's on the outside, the exterior. So uh, for example, if I'm an organelle and I've got a motor protein on me, that motor protein can reach out and grab onto the outside of the microtubule and then move me along it. Uh, what happens inside of a microtubule? To my knowledge, nothing. I think that's just the way it's structurally formed for and evolved, probably for stability. But yeah, it's on the exterior. Yes. Oh, I thought I saw a hand. OK. Um, okay. So cilia and flagella then. Uh, they don't have this dynamic instability I've been telling you about. Their microtubules are stable. And remember, so far we've said that there are two types of movement along microtubules, dynein and kinesin-based movements. The axonemal, the axonemal uh, microtubules have just one of them, dynein, not kinesin. So what does a cilium or a flagellum look like? Well, remember when we were talking about cytoplasmic microtubules, we were talking about this nucleation site with the gamma tubulin, and then you form your microtubule from there? This is analogous to that, what I'm going to tell you next. Microtubule, I mean, uh, sorry, <laughs> cilia and flagella have what are called basal bodies. They're the nucleation sites for, ax for axonemal microtubules. These basal bodies 
consist of nine triplets of microtubules arranged in this pattern here. So if you take this and turn it 90 degrees and look at a cross section, this is what it looks like. Each of these little circles here is a single microtubule, three, 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 so 27 all the way around. And these basal bodies are where you form your cilium or your flagellum on. So what does a cilium look like? If you take a cross section through here and looked at the cilium, this is what you would see. You have a, what's called a nine plus two array. Nine doublets on the outside, so 18 total microtubules, and then a pair in the middle called the two. Now this is super confusing um, because of the math of it, or not even the math, the numbers, but this is the way these things have been named. I wish they hadn't. Because what they're doing is when they say nine plus two, they're saying nine pairs and two singles in the middle. If they talked about pairs, they should have said nine plus one. And if they wanted to talk about singles, they should have said 18 plus two, but they didn't, whoever they is, right? So it, this is this, you just have to kind of learn the nomenclature. A nine plus two array means nine pairs on the outside and two single microtubules in the middle. Each microtubule has that structure we've talked about, protofilaments, alpha, beta, tubulin base, all that good stuff. And then notice you've got these red things here. These are radial spokes that come out that help give some st uh, structure with respect to the center uh, array here. <clears throat> and then there's, in this red line here, represents a protein called Nexen. Nexen connects each of these pairs to each other going all the way around. And that, you'll see why that's important in just a second. This is another diagram, same thing, just showing you a little bit more simply. Here's that uh, cross-section of your cilium, nine pairs, two in the inside, uh, and here's what the different components are. So again, you have your pairs of microtubules, Sorry, yes, your pairs of microtubules. You have your next end now in blue that's attaching them. And then you also have dynein, which was not something I was indicated on this diagram. So dynein is present here, attached as an inner dynein arm, this one, and an outer dynein arm out here. Now again, remember, these are motor proteins, dynein. Not nexin, but dynein is a motor protein. Dynein, remember, moves towards which end? Minus or plus? Minus. So if you took a microtubule and a dynein and gave them some ATP, it would just move towards the minus end. But that's not what happens with your cilia and flagella, and now we're going to see why. So again, this is what I just said. If you just took two microtubules, or two pairs of microtubules, because we're talking about pairs here, right? If you had these two pairs of microtubules, and you had dynein shown in red here, bound from one to the other, and you added ATP, because the dynein wants to move to the minus end, well, it can't because it's stuck on both sides now. So instead of it moving to the minus end, the microtubules slide along each other. Right? So if it's like if I was trying to walk on something, but I was holding on to something, maybe I'd just move the treadmill or whatever instead. And that's the sliding motion that results because the dynein is stuck on both sides, in a sense. It's, it's, stu it's, it's anchored into one microtubule, and it's moving like this on the other one. All right? Now, what happens in your cilia and in your flagella, and this is sperm right here uh, as an example, because sperm have flagella, so you zoom in on that and you take a look. In reality, what happens is you have these linking proteins shown in blue. And the linking protein that I've mentioned to you is Nexen, this guy right here. So what happens is that when the sliding tries to happen, it can't get away because these things are stuck together. The microtubule pairs are stuck together because of the Nexen. So instead of sliding away, it bends. You know, you can try this with anything at home, right? If you try to move along something, but you're stuck together with something else, eventually you're going to translate that energy into a bending motion. And so it's a combination of the fact that dynein is a motor protein that tries to move towards the minus end, but can't, because it's anchored to one microtubule, combined with the fact that nexin is, com is connecting both microtubules, sorry, both microtubule pairs. And as a result, the pairs bend with respect to each other. And that bending happens super fast. And when you have super fast bending and relaxation, you end up with what's called a power stroke. So your cilium or your flagellum moves rapidly and actually creates a circular vortex outside of the cell. When you look at this uh, in real life, this is what it looks like. These are sperm that are being uh, in a dish. And you can see how rapidly this flagellum is, is basically rotating and moving. In the case of sperm, the flagellum movement creates, it's, like it's like a boat having a propeller and it creates basically motion-based flow, and then the sperm is able to move in the opposite direction just like the boat does. Uh, and you can see here in this experiment, they took a pipette and they cut right there, and it maintains this motion. 
because of what I just told you. The motion is not dependent on anything in the cell here. It's a self-contained process because all it needs is these proteins that are already in the flagellum and a source of energy, ATP. And when you have that source of energy, remember, that's how uh, motor proteins are going to work, is they move, they try to move. So it's a self-contained process where all you need is the proteins and an energy source to do this. Okay, any questions about this? Yes. Oh, in this, in, in, in this image, why is the sperm not moving? Uh, I don't know. It's possible they have it in some sticky substance, probably, or like, like in a glycerol-based thing, or maybe it's on a dish or something like that. Um, you know, you, there's only so much force that it's going to generate. Uh, also, I, I just, I, it's a little bit, I mean, I don't know what speed this was filmed at, but based on the movement of the pipette, if this is real-time speed, it's not very fast. So it's possible that they haven't given enough ATP to generate enough force to get it to move. Any other questions? OK, so the last thing I'll leave you with today, and don't start packing up. I should stop saying that, because as soon as I say last thing, everybody starts to. Anyway. OK, so is uh, cilia, so this, these are flagella on sperm. Cilia are like flagella. In other words, if you cut one open and look at the cross section, it would look exactly the same. But they're a lot shorter. And instead of being a motor boat that's got a propeller, you really have something that's kind of sticking off of a cell that instead of moving the cell, its job is to move something outside of the cell. And we have cilia and many of our tissues that perform really critical functions. So for example, you know, like uh, last week I had a, a cold that I'm getting over, and um, you bring up a lot of phlegm. That phlegm comes up because in your lungs you have cells that have rapidly beating cilia, and those cilia are acting as vacuums, not vacuums, but like um, brushes. And they're brushing all this stuff out of your lungs, the gunk, and bringing it up into your upper respiratory tract. All right, so they're really critically important uh, in your airways as respiratory cilia, shown here in green on this cell. Uh, there are many other uses, and you know, just FYI, these are some examples where you have motile cilia, 9 plus 2, like I showed you, and these are some places where those are present. We talked about sperm. I just mentioned respiratory to you. There are also non-motile cilia, and that's something that you need to be aware of, is that sometimes that middle pair, um, this, is not present. And when it's not present, you don't have an anchor point to move around, and you can't have this motor-based motion. And so those cilia don't move, but they have other functions that they do. For example, when you smell your coffee, you're using cilia on olfactory receptor neurons in your nose. All right, And there's a lot of other uses for non-motile cilia in, in various tissues as well. There are exceptions to this. On rare occasion, you can have 9 plus 2 like this, where you could move, but they don't. And on very rare occasion, you can have the absence of that middle pair, and you can still move, but not very effectively. So in biology, there's always an exception to every rule, right? But basically, this is the general rule. 9 plus 2, you're motile. If you're 9 plus 0, you're non-motile. With that, I'll stop there. These are just kind of fun slides if you're interested in the topic. And if we have time, I'll cover them next time. Here are some cool videos. I'll let this play as you guys leave. These are cilia on a cell. And these are uh, beating cilia live in a zebrafish embryo from my lab. All right, see you next. Oh, spring break's next week, right? Have a nice, safe spring break, and I will see you after that.